once you get a lead, how do you manage that? How do you nurture that? How do you generate a quote and follow up on that quote, get it accepted, schedule it, whether it's a product or a service, get that fulfilled, and then invoice it and get paid. What's the best way for people to identify if they have a problem? Because you know, like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of mentality. Like, we see that all the time. And I'm like, why are you doing that when you can do this? And they're like, whoa, what? There was a plumbing company that we helped out that was, I think, doing $4 million worth of business, but the owner was still doing all the estimates because they knew which subcontractor could do certain skills and what their rates were, and they didn't trust anyone else in the company. Welcome to the Sightshed Podcast. Thanks for having me, Matt. All the way from downtown Toronto. <laughs> yeah, before we were just talking baseball and the Toronto Blue Jays and, and all that. So it's uh, nice to know that we, all the way in, our, in Australia that you're still following the, well, the Blue my, Jays. <laughs> as my mates frequently remind me, we also follow baseball. <laughs> Anyway, we're not here to talk about baseball, sadly, but we are here to talk um, a little bit about some of the technology within the trade, within the trades. And um, before we get started, I might even just get you to give a bit of an intro and let us know who you are, what you do, where you're from, and how you got there. Yeah, sure. So as you mentioned, Paul Jackson, I'm the uh, founder and CEO of of Method. So we are uh, a 100-person software company, been around for about 14 years. Uh, and we, we sell to small, really small businesses who use QuickBooks and Zero. Like that's those are our customers. So we're talking about like, is Zero got a bigger footprint in North America these days? No, no, no. Still struggling to get to get started, but mm. it's great software. So it's a matter of time. Um, it's Would mostly great if they, QuickBooks if they online. It as a as a as a Zero user, like I think I feel like from the time I signed up with zero 12 years ago and today very little has changed well accounting hasn't changed that much <laughs> really what what should change change the ecosystem around it in my mind like the right. accounting should do accounting and then uh operation software which is what like, where i live in should do operation software so like that's that's what we do we, we just help small businesses that are scaling they usually hit around 10 or so employees and whatever was working before doesn't work anymore and they need some kind of tool to help them scale and that's what they use us for and when you say scale like what problems do you guys currently solve like i'm guessing you don't recruit staff i'm guessing you don't like help them generate leads well we help them we help them handle their leads so we we think of where we step in, because there's so many areas, like especially in the CRM world where, where we live, there's so many different meanings of what that could be. Totally. Um, we limit we limit from lead through to cash. So uh, once you get a lead, how do you how do you manage that? How do you nurture that? How do you generate a quote and then follow up on that quote, get it accepted, schedule it, whether it's a product or a service, um, get that fulfilled and then invoice it and get paid like that. There's a lot of workflows that happen there. So really anywhere along that path, whether it's the whole thing or just one key part, that's, that's really becoming a bottleneck for a business. That's what they'll use us for. And what's nice is that it syncs with their accounting system. So they don't have to do double entry or uh, have a huge setup process. They can, they can just sync and then they can just step in where, where they need to have some automation. I, I, so we, not, we're not hugely in the technology space, but we, we have a, um, like a white label version of a tool called high level, which is, a um, like a marketing software, which we basically brand and we have like a whole bunch of frameworks and things that we deploy for clients. But the biggest thing that we've noticed within that, oh, I mean, truthfully, we've been noticing it for years, but it's the, you kind of touched on it before. It's not so much like the, the tool itself. You never find one tool that will do everything. So the power really that we're seeing is in the integrations and the ones that have that ability to integrate, to avoid double entry. And then there's, so, there's a lot of tools out there 
but just don't integrate. And I'm like, it's very hard for us to refer them to people <laughs> because we just can't integrate it with our CRM, you know? Yeah, and I think that's the, 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 the traditional package software world, uh, which is like my past. I can maybe get into that if you want to know what my past was, is that you, you build integrations between multiple systems and um, that are all best of breed and doing one thing and do that one thing really well. Um, and you integrate everything together. And that's what small businesses need because they can't afford anything custom. They can only afford a bunch of small little uh, point solutions. But the challenge, of course, is it becomes Frankenstein. <laughs> it's like the yeah. system rarely works smoothly. Things are constantly breaking. Uh, products change. They change. They need to sub, sub out one tool, no tool. It's, it's, it's really hard. Uh, and so I think there is more of a shift away from Frankensteining and more to um, one size, like, like all in one systems. Um, and that's brought on usually by uh, like no code. So uh, platforms that can be customized to individual needs. So you don't have to Frankenstein too much. You can get all in, in one system for, for a small business. That's a, it's a whole big topic. I'm happy to dive into but Depends where you want to yeah, go. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of where, um, uh, like tools like Zoho sort of, what's that they're trying to achieve, right? Where they have like a whole bunch of apps and stuff that you can bolt on to expand yeah. your suite. Yeah, and they have like Zoho Creator for customization yeah. and they have the Zoho Books. So the you, problem is you could, like this shit. Yes. No offense. Well, so I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to slam my, um, would be competitors, but oh, are they actually? <laughs> so you're in that kind of space. It's sort of like a one similar yeah. comparative tool. Yeah, that we uh, like the um, the big the big thing I I noticed really early on in my career. This is this is going back to the year 2000 when I had my first company. I was I was uh, I was selling software for service businesses, mainly, it's mainly landscaping. Like, so, so lawn maintenance, irrigation, um, we had some pest control and, and lawn fertilization companies too. That'd be a big six, six months of the year, uh, job, job out in. Yeah, it was, it was, it was um, <laughs> well, most of our customers were in the U S you had a longer season, <laughs> but yeah, it was like November was when the, the selling demo season started. And then you, you sell hard right until April, then May, the summer you're supporting all your customers and that's that was the software business that we had back then okay. but the 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 learning we had really early on in that company was that everyone just loves their quickbooks it's right. probably like in, in america yeah. yes everyone loves their quickbooks and the same would be said for probably the uk australia new zealand everyone loves their zero they don't want to go to zoho books <laughs> they, they like quickbooks they like zero right yeah. so uh, the uh, the idea is to uh, attach on to that the things that the accounting system does not do. And um, back at my first company, it was scheduling. Like QuickBooks did not do scheduling. You couldn't you couldn't schedule jobs onto a calendar, and you couldn't um, assign those jobs to a, a a technician and have those completed work orders turn into invoices at the end of the day. Like that's what that's what job software was for. And so. Um, that was the, that was the problem that my first company solved. And after the job was invoiced, it was like, let QuickBooks handle the rest. That's all people really wanted. <laughs> and, uh, we, we kind of brought that learn to, to method. The, um, the problem I've seen this problem over the years a number of times with businesses that use their bookkeeping software as CRM. And they have all their like contacts and all this sort of stuff going in there. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, it's an absolute nightmare when you <laughs> look into it, you know? Um, and I think, I mean, you see that, I see that commonly in many different scenarios, but I mean, is this kind of where tools like Make and Zapier sort of have their place to help people bridge those gaps, although they're clunky and rarely work? Well, if something like Zapier would would ha would, would um, take a, another pro program, like if it's a lead capture program, whatever it might be, 
and zap the the contacts into exactly. QuickBooks, right? Or or pull them out of QuickBooks into another product. But zapping by itself is, isn't useful. It has to it has to actually connect two or more things together. Connected, yeah. I think yeah, I think back to your scenario of, of like a lot of contractors or small businesses using QuickBooks as their CRM. Sure. I mean, when you're two or three people, um, why wouldn't you? <laughs> it makes it makes complete sense. Like I think that's what small businesses do. They start off with what works today and they they gradually scale and before they know it they're they've got a bunch of office staff. Um and you really start realizing that's that's a huge problem. We don't want people in our accounting system who aren't accountants, like that's someone who's taking phone calls and, and they're, they're just scheduling jobs. Why do they need to have access to the accounting? That's, that's at a certain point crazy. And so you need to take those, those two systems and separate them. Like you need to have your CRM software, your tr job tracking software, be what your dispatcher uses and you need your accounting software to be what your back office people, your bookkeepers are using, but you need to share information. So if a customer calls in to the dispatcher and says, Hey, I need to pay my bill. The dispatcher can't be like, Hey, Wendy, uh, does, does she still owe money or not? Like I, I can't see in the, the tracking software. They have to actually see that customer's data right there. Otherwise it's a terrible high friction, uh, experience to the customer on the end of the phone. So, that's where getting the two systems to talk and the right people using the right system starts to make a lot of sense. That's part of scaling. That that happens after you grow from using QuickBooks as a CRM or zero as a CRM to actually using a CRM. Yeah, sure. So what are commonly some of the, I suppose, the main problems that you see when people are coming to you like as a, as a, as a solution they need solved? Yeah, like so, like we do cut customers coming to a method who are just looking for a CRM just to manage leads and manage pipeline. Um, that's not that's not why I get up in the morning. Like that's that's not no because there's exciting. a hundred million of them. Yeah, like that's not then that's not really what we it that's not where we we excel. So the. I'll go back to how we got here. So, okay. So 14 years ago, I sold that first like lawn care software, irrigation software business to one of the leading uh, consolidators of, of trade software. And uh, I'm sitting around with my existing team in, in our, in our boardroom. And we're like, what do we do now? I think I was, I think I was probably 33, 34. So really way too young to retire. Um, and I had a, a team that wanted to do something new and we looked at what we, what was the biggest problem with our customers, uh, all of our, we, we'd had two and a half thousand companies using our software. So we had a whole bunch of customers and what killed us the most was that when they scaled, when they changed, they had to break up with us because their needs changed because we had like a package solution. This is how you schedule a job. This is how you turn a job into an invoice. This is how you do your job costing. This is the, this is the way to do it. This is the only way. And if your needs change, you, you needed to change software. So we, we thought, what, what would be really cool is if we can make a company that allowed small businesses to change software without, without changing everybody else's software. So you could have 2,500 companies all with 2,500 different versions of of the tool, it changes as they change. That would be really neat. That would be a kind of a holy grail of software if you could do something like that. Um, so what we came up with was what's now called no code. So that back then in 2010, there was no such thing as no code. That I think so Gardner from Pearl Jam album, just on a segue. It, wasn't that Coda? No, that's, that's Led Zeppelin. No code. There's a no code for Pearl Jam? Yeah. So they yeah, started like, the whole thing, huh? Eddie you Vedder. You don't have to question me on uh, on on Pearl Jam. <laughs> okay, it is. It is a fact. <laughs> I will check that out. I, I I give all the I give all credit to No Code to uh, to Forrester and Gardner Research Companies. I didn't realize that Eddie Vedder gets all the no. It's all, all Eddie Vedder. So you probably own a shit ton of loyalties. <laughs> Eddie, if you're listening, cash in. <laughs> Eddie, hey, of course hey. he's listening. Nice to listen to you. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, so so no code. 
which is the idea that, that, uh, small companies or really actually any company can drag and drop, use wizards and make business apps without knowing how to code, which, um, which I mean, is that's great if you're a small business. Next going, isn't it? Like you look at even, you know, uh, WordPress, um, themes yes. like Elementor, like <laughs> you don't need the like, HTML anymore. Right? You don't like, you don't need to know that. Yeah. Um, the, the, even enterprise software though is going that way. It's more, it's more called low code. So very small amounts of scripting, but r rather than making huge multi-year, multi-million dollar, uh, custom applications in the enterprise, they're just doing low code, which is small iter iterations of existing templates. And sure. they, they can go to, to market in usually internally in, uh, in weeks or months versus years. And the, the small business equivalent of that is not scripting. It's, it's just pure no code, no scripting, just drag and drop, make modifications to, to templates or build your own templates. Um, and that, so that's what we wanted to build. We didn't know that Pearl Jam was going to soon be calling it no code, but, um, or Forrester either. We just thought that that'd be a really cool idea. And so, so that's what we've been building for the last 14 years is just a, a way for, for small businesses to build and modify little apps that solve their business problems. So what are some of those apps? <clears throat> well, it varies. I think like the, a lot of the common ones are around estimating. So oh. like that look, so if, you, if you look at these businesses that are, that are scaling a lot of, a lot of where the, the key person, in the company, the founder has kind of wedged himself or herself as a bottleneck in a company is often around estimates. That's pretty much a <laughs> It's pretty much a prophecy for business. I think, like, remove the business owner. Like, does it? Sure. Yeah, but but when you're the only one that knows the secret sauce of how you bill and how you oh. allocate skills, <laughs> like, there's there's a as a plumbing company that we uh, we helped out that was, um, I think, doing four million dollars worth of business, but the owner was still doing all the estimates because they knew which subcontractors could do certain skills and what their rates were. And they didn't trust anyone else in the company to know all these rules. And they were just, they couldn't scale any anymore. So they, they said, okay, hey, we heard method. You can make custom apps. Can you make custom estimate forms that like have rules? We're like, yeah, sure. So we built out a, a rule system so that if you chose a certain part, it told you who, what skilled subcontractors were available to do that one and what the rates would be. And then anyone in the company could build a a plumbing estimate not the owner anymore and just mm. so that's one example um there's this one's like one. we, we have yeah. <clears throat> like i'll just relate this back to i suppose a well, it's not necessarily a bottleneck as such but like an observation that we have because when in the <clears throat> like the agency that i run trading with guys we generate uh like leads for businesses but then we also take those leads and we book them into our clients calendars right and normally at that point in time in the discovery call they're giving them an estimate on you know what that pr product's going to be worth as part of the qualification criteria to make sure they're not just low ballers or whatever right and so we normally would design like a matrix for that for the client to say okay well if this is this type of roof with this type of you know square meter edge and needs guttering and fascia board and blah 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 all that kind of stuff like that kind of thing but it is kind of laborious because it's uh, you've, it's based on a matrix, you know, it's not like a template. Yeah. It's, but, but every business is like that. Right. So every business has these, these rules on how they do their estimates. So if you're a, a landscaper, you're thinking, okay, well, there's a lawn, it's, it's 4,000 square feet, but how many lineal feet of flower beds are there? Because that's extra trimming time. And, and how much hardscape, uh, square feet is there for me to use the blower on, I guess. How do I do that estimate? And there's a, probably a certain way you go about that process and you want to make sure that whoever you do, who does your estimates for you, does it in that same way. And, and so you can write it down. You can write down your rules, which are like your kind of your standard operating procedures and more enterprise terminology, but you can write them down and you can have people follow them, or you can make a dummy proof where they just click, 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 click and follow your rules. Mm. And then you can scale. Yeah, so it's no longer you doing it anymore. You can trust your staff to, to do things that only you could do and get the, get the owner, operator, founder out of the way. So how does quality control play into that dynamic? 
So, well, so what? Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think you make a dummy proof that, that is quality control, right? So in terms of the estimation process, like if there's if there's rules, then the software, assuming it works, like the, it's been designed properly, will follow those rules and and won't make any errors. So there's the quality control of the estimate. But I guess there's also quality control of the job, making sure the job is done correctly. But I don't think that's your question. No, no, yeah, I'm, I'm more yeah. referring to making sure that the you know, like, it, it, does there need to be a layer of peer review or are you saying if you design the tool in the right way, then essentially you can eliminate that step because it's done the right way from the get-go? Yeah, I mean, it's still it's still in a way human logic, right? Mm. So if someone's going through the wizard and they're building these apps out um, and their their logic was bad, then the software will not work. And so it depends on who's doing it. Like, um, in my, in my, my dreamy world where I, uh, I envisioned small business owners doing work all day and come back at night and like customizing apps in the nighttime and building their own systems, then they're the ones doing all this customization and, um, hopefully they don't make mistakes uh, and they, they, they test it out, make sure that their, their, their systems work in reality, most small businesses will still have some professional do that customizing. It's just like so, so, so much cheaper than having someone code something. Like you're talking about like a custom estimate process. It's probably only a few hundred bucks of time. This drag and drop is so quick to do. So they, they'll hire our team or third parties. Um, there's a big partner network to do it. Uh, and they'll go through the quality control to make sure that their, their logic is sound. Mm-hmm. That's, so that's some estimates, but there's, I mean, there's so really you pick any, any part of the process, like the, the cash process is very common too. Like, uh, being able to, um, send out that estimate, but, but get a, get a payment for like a down payment, 50% deposit. Like that. <laughs> most, most of the time we got, so I, this house I'm setting it right now, we, we built this, uh, three years ago. And um, we had, I don't know, a hundred different contractors come through and the process with which we pay the down payment (laughs) was different almost every time, but it was almost always manual. There was no automated system. Um, But whereas some of the method customers will, will send out a quote from like an estimate form um, to someone's email or or text SMS, uh, the customer will click on the link and then they will, they will see that quote and there'll be a digital sign it right there on the spot. No need to, to sign and run it back to the, the property or whatever manual method that we speak in the past. No need to add DocuSign or any kind of Frankenstein tool. It's all built in and then receive payment right then and there, whether it's like PayPal or authorized.net or, or QuickBooks payments, whatever the, the preferred payment system is. Pay right there, have the payment flow right through to zero or, or through to QuickBooks. Um, there's like those kind of workflows save a huge amount of time. Um, and that's, a, that's pretty common for us, like customer facing, like where customers can see, um, the, the automation, um, low friction high, like it's a really good customer experience to be able to pay online. Like you would with a large company. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Now you're in Australia. So I think, I think you're ahead of North America with automated payments. We're pretty good, actually. Like, yeah, it's, yeah. I think you're pretty good. Yeah, like, I think like, there's still a lot of checks that are being written in, in the U.S. Oh man, really? Like, like paper yeah. checks, like handing checks to each other. That's that's still a thing. Yeah, I, I recently bought a new car, actually, and they, um, they, they said, "Oh, well, they they cocked a few things up on the on the on the payment side." But they're like, "Oh, you can you can go and get us a bank check." And I'm like, bank? What is it? Nineteen twenty? Give you a fucking bank check? Are you joking? Well, that was, that was one of the biggest problems that Zero had when they first came into the U.S. Because because in the U.K. and Australia, New Zealand, checks were gone. They're I was they're gone with the dinosaurs, and they come to the U.S. They're like, "Here you go. Here's our accounting software." All the Americans are like, "Where's the checks? Yeah, where do I? Where do I <laughs> this is dead on arrival. What do you mean there's no, there's no checks? So I think they've they've probably improved that since. But, but Canada's but, not like that, right? 
I think we're kind of, we're probably in between. We're right. like half Australian, half American. I think we have probably more payment systems uh, than the US, but there's still checks that float around. Paper yeah, wow. checks. I mean, I've, honestly, I've never, I've never had a checkbook in 12 yeah. years of business. I've never had a checkbook. Yeah, we, we still have checks. Mm. I but it's it's, it's, it's rare now, but we still use them sometimes. I mean, it's just the, I feel like you should be charging a, a surcharge if someone gives you a check for the time it takes. Got to take you to go to the bank and cash it, or bank it, or whatever you do it. <laughs> yeah, fold it right? in a paper airplane. It's crazy. It but like what's it. even what's even more insane too is that um, if you get a paper check, our banks allow you to take a picture of it with your mobile app, and then you can deposit. So, so like at least that's like automated however if it's a business account no gotta go walk in it sure i mean i, I feel like that's an impending disaster if you just take a photo. <laughs> yeah so we're still a little bit behind on the whole check thing it reminds me i saw this thing the other day on facebook or, or something i can't remember on youtube maybe or whatever it was like this, <laughs> this dad and he is he goes like within this box there's a puzzle he's talking to his teenage boys in this box there's a puzzle and you have four minutes to solve the puzzle and he lifts the lid off the box and it's like an old dial phone. Yeah. And, and, the, and the note there says, you have four minutes to call this number. <laughs> and he's like, what the heck is this? And they're like trying to figure out how to use the old dial phone. It was the best. The like, most oh, simple man. escape room you could ever imagine is just yeah, a phone. So <laughs> oh man, my dad was cracking up laughing. <laughs> well, you got the hero right, or the one they actually had to go all the way around on. Like, oh, man, <laughs> Why would you do it like that? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think um, I think for the most part, though, North America is as modern as Australia and New Zealand would be. But uh, I think it's the checks is the one thing that I think it's just because we're probably lazier. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, I'm not really sure what the reason is. Um, it could be because the U.S. has so many banks. Yeah, that that, that the, this is harder, more costly to consolidate everything. Yeah, it's Whereas less people, less banks, less red tape, maybe. Well, Can Canada's got like five or six banks total. Yeah, yeah that's all we have. It's probably similar to, to Australia. You probably don't have the tens of thousands of banks that the U.S. has. Mm. It's, it's probably part of the part of the thing. Anyway, back to trade software. Yeah, that's one of the, that's one of the areas that we help a lot of small businesses. They they. They do like getting paid faster. They do like cutting out steps between. So the steps between would be government. where you've got a uh, quote that then you would need accepted, which would then turn into a invoice. We call an invoice, I guess, which yeah. would then get sent and then get paid, which would then get turned into a receipt, which would then get sent, right? Are they, are they, is that kind of what we're trying to streamline here? That and it's, whole, yeah, and all that's happening... Like that's a lot of back and forth, right? If you're not doing automation, that's a lot of back and forth, a lot of manual entry into back in the office, a lot of time for the customer to change their mind or get distracted and not and delay the project. Um, the uh, the idea is that a customer can do that all in one in one step, sign it, pay it, submit it, and have all that flow automatically into the accounting system and into the CRM as soon as I, the click is pressed without any further entry by the staff. It just means that like. The staff that you have are doing more product work, like getting a product shipped or service work, getting your services uh, performed rather than overhead in the office and fewer mistakes are being made. So when you say when the records are being sent straight into the, the, the bookkeeping software, like what, what wouldn't do that? Like, we, I mean, we, we currently, we take payments through, through our system. It all runs through Stripe. Stripe sends out records straight into zero and it's, all, it's in there straight away. Yeah, I don't think most like most systems don't do that. Like, so you've integrated Stripe with a platform. Yeah, but but you would have. But what what invoice are are you, are you is Stripe associating that with? Are you sending the invoice to Stripe? So, the in, so you're, cre invoice, you're creating in zero and sending to Stripe. The invoice gets created in. So the invoice gets created in zero. <sighs> Yeah, the invoice gets created in zero. So it gets sent out of, out of the software. It gets uh, replicated in zero, I guess. I don't even know, to be honest. I just know it works. I've never had to think about it. 
Yeah, yeah I think I think if, if you're just doing a manual invoice and you're manually sending the invoice to your payment solution, and the payment solution then receives payment and then comes back and fills that invoice, yeah, then I think you're good. But if you if you want more automation around that, like how the invoice get created, was it manually or was it through a completion of a quote or okay. um, some kind of formula or wizard that that like an estimator in the field did? How's that getting to Strife? Like I got it. So essentially, what we're saying yeah. is like we're, with the ability to be able to have someone who's out on site, they've got an estimate. The client goes, "Yep, looks good." Bang, straight into a payment quote. They can pay right there. They can sign the agreement, and it's all just done. Point of sale. Yeah, and you're still using it's still going to Stripe if you want if you're if you want to use Stripe. That's the payment processor, and still sure. it's still going to zero in, in the back end. But all the all that the the heavy lifting, the the stuff that's different about your business, which is usually the estimation process or the uh, or a, a sales order process if you're like making products. Uh, that's different, but like putting in a credit card or bank information into a form and hitting submit, that's the same for everybody. Right. Right. So things that are the same for everybody. Yeah. You don't need custom software for things that are different specific to you. It's usually better if you can to do things specific to you. That way you don't have to conform to the way everyone else is doing it. You can do it your way. Well, yeah. So large companies do, right? Yeah, that's right. And, if, and one of the big things we try and teach our clients as well, it's like, like build processes that uniquely define you you know especially like we, we we deal heavily within the sales process for them so we help them design this amazing sales process so their customers are just blown away by it but then same thing i suppose like that this could definitely become part of that because the bottom the bottleneck they have at the moment is there's still often a disconnect between uh, the estimate that's been sent and then the time that it takes to go and develop and quote like that's a there's often sometimes days between that, which is something that we're trying to radically eliminate because like who has the time for that these days? Again, what was it, 1920? Like that old model, you know, where people like they go to site, they or they they quote a job, they disappear, they show up two days, or they send it or send it back to them two days later for them just to go and price shop that. Like that is it's it's crazy. Yeah. And, and what do you get? And someone who's eager, a customer who's eager is going to take the first acceptable quote. So the whoever can get that done faster is going to get more business. Hundred percent. Like if you exactly you come here, like give me the quote and schedule the job. Like I'm not going to go shopping around for the sake of a thousand bucks or whatever it is. Like I don't give a shit. Just get it scheduled so I can get get it done. And <laughs> but you will if you have to wait four days for it because you're like I'm. Uh, exactly. I don't know I'm just going to shop. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm back from yeah. them. <laughs> so so th these are these are important things that I think can, uh, to, to your point. If you allow them to build differentiators that are that makes their business different, they'll close more business. Mm. Like for me, this is the best part of small business. Totally, they 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 they're all unique. How they got there, how they got to be unique, is always a story. Like this is like a, a business that I, I I grabbed my parents, and this is the way they always did it. Or I used to do this out of uni, and um. I learned I learned certain skills that I really were, was good at, and then I figured out how to run a business out of it, and then I got there this way. Or I'm from this neighborhood, and this neighborhood we do things this way. And they all, every business that, that does the same, the same uh, in the same industry, they all look the same on the surface. But when you get, when you dig down deep, they're all different. And That's so right. why so why shouldn't they run their companies different if they are different? Mm. Yeah, no, like That's it. the best part of small business. Like I love hearing stories about how. How different these guys are. So let me ask you this then, I suppose, just before we wrap up. What is um well what's your uh in your opinion or in your experience, I should say, what's the best way for people to identify if they have a problem? Because you know, like if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of mentality. Like we see that all the time, and I'm like, why are you doing that when you can do this? And they're like, Whoa, what? I think they should look for bottlenecks. So um if a, if a company is scaling and they, and they realize they have bottlenecks, things aren't as smooth as before. They know there's chaos, right? They know if there's if they're reaching you know a when, breaking point. You know, point. sometimes when chaos is so like embedded and part of the process that it doesn't even really get observed, like it just becomes the way it is. Like, I'll give you an example, right? I used to be a plumber, uh, and when I remember going through my apprenticeship, 
And I used to work for a maintenance company, um, like residential maintenance company on the North Shore of Sydney. And going through my apprenticeship, like it was normal for me and them to go and do a job, to pull out the carbon copy book, uh, write the invoice or write the job out, tear one off, give one to the client, go back to the office, tear the other one off, give it to the office lady and then wait, you know, two months to probably not get paid or until it's like someone has to go follow them up, right? And that was normal. And then I went and started working for another company and all of a sudden they had these big, I mean, back then, we're talking 20 odd years ago. So this is a long, you know, well, this is a long time or more actually. <laughs> Jesus, you know, um, you know, we had these big bank terminals, like, you know, these big things from the banks and it was this big clunky thing and it used to cost like 200 bucks a month to use. It was a joke. But I'm like, they could literally go to the job and they could get paid right there and then. And I was like, whoa. What the hell? <laughs> but like, it, I, like what was w working before? It kind of was. I'm sure they didn't even know they had a problem. Yeah, I, 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 this is hard. I think an expert going into a business, like a consultant, could take out some of these things pretty easily because they have context of all the other businesses and who's using terminals, who's not. But I think if if you don't have a consultant, I would ask yourself, uh, if you're to double your your company tomorrow, where would it break? And I think that would create some some pretty deep thinking. The, the the best thing to do is to map out what the processes are that you're doing today. What are the workflow? What are the sequential steps from taking a lead all the way through to accepting payment? Like a workflow and kind of Yeah, what no. what are those workflows? And and start asking yourself a few questions. Which ones are highly repetitive? If they're highly repetitive, Bing, bing, bing. Maybe a good opportunity for automation. Um, if it's not a repetitive, maybe it's not a problem. Uh, which ones are customer facing? So which ones do customers actually get to witness friction face on? Like right, it's right in their eyes. Those are probably ding, ding, ding worth taking, taking a small automation to. Um, which ones don't require a lot of critical thinking? Because critical thinking should probably leave to humans from now until AI totally takes over. Uh, so which ones don't require any critical thinking? Those probably are good candidates. And then fourth is, the, I think, the biggest one. Which one still requires the key people in the company? That's the big one. Because if you're still doing things that no one else can do, and you're the founder, the owner, the COO, whatever you want to call yourself, if you're doing things that no one else can do, that's a big problem. Mm. And then what I would do is I would just prioritize these things. Some you should automate with software. Some you can just delegate with steps to someone else. Some you just let, let them be. Let them be manual for now. If they're not, if they're not highly repetitive, if they're not bottlenecks in the company, they don't touch customers directly, maybe, maybe let them sit. Just focus on the ones that, that affect a key person in the company and are highly repetitive. What is it? Do yourself, delegate or delete? The, I've seen that before. Wasn't that it's not a book isn't an old uh, Steve Jobs one? Like I got oh, to look into that after after I look into the note code from uh, <laughs> from Eddie <laughs> Better, I'll check into the Steve Jobs quotes. <laughs> Classic. Oh man, this is good. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah. I suppose. Anyway, you're right. It, like, having the the advantage of having somebody look into your business with a non bias view on it is sometimes very, I mean, truthfully, that's the reason why this podcast exists because people listen to this and they go, oh shit, maybe I do have a problem. But you don't really know until you get exposure to other ways of doing things, right? Um, I don't know. I, I think that most, most small business owners, they, they live that chaos. They live that feeling. They know that there, there's a problem. Sure. I think there's probably areas where they're like, I don't know what I don't know. Like the, like the bank terminal. But I think, I think they're feeling the heat. I think they, I think a small business that's that is, um, that is scaled a little bit, and are just doing the things that they used to always do, and they're doing doing it now and ten times the size. I think that they're realizing that they're, they're smart. They're realizing there's problems. Like there's there's staff who are grumbling. Hey, what I have to wait for you? Or hey, like shouldn't you get someone else to do that? Like they. They start feeling maybe that they're not doing a great job as running the company. Like I've, I've definitely felt like that in my career as I've scaled, and, and I think 
most small business owners do know that that they are the the source of the problem sometimes. So what does the what does the future look like in this space? In the space that we are in, the the Eddie Vedder, Vedder no code world, I think I think it's really interesting. Like so. Big AI, you, right? so what's, what, what's that going to do? Big AI shift makes it easier, right? So if you have two pieces of software doing the same thing, whether it's lead capture or whether it's accepting payments, whatever it might be, and one was made by coders, scripters, people typing in a, in a dev shop somewhere, and one was made uh, by no code, which means it's malleable, you can change it. Who's going to win if they're, if they're exactly the same? Hmm. The malleable one, like as you change, your software changes like it's that one's always going to win so as no code is getting better and better and better you're going to see more of the incumbents replaced by no code solutions i think that's really exciting and and to your point in ai that's where it becomes um, more for the masses so rather than having to be somebody who can go in and use wizards and still take some thinking you can just type out like hey i am a dog walker i walk dogs um three times a week and I need to keep track of my schedule and I need to charge monthly for how many times I go out. Um, that's enough information now for, it to be for a no code app to build what are called uh, objects, which can then be used to actually make an app from scratch for you based on your description. That's pretty cool. And so you could use some generic dog walking application or some generic field service application that you're going to try and contour to dog walking. <laughs> Or you get your own custom app by a script that you typed out or a prompt that you typed out. That's the future. I think the the no code future is really interesting. It's pretty amazing now. I've been playing around, you know, with the with that, the new Apple integration with OpenAI, and um, you can have your yeah. assistant, <laughs> and you can literally just talk to this assistant like it's a person. Like, yeah, I'm I'm looking for a recipe for blah blah. blah. What, what do you reckon? And they go, <laughs> it's it's pretty crazy. <laughs> It is. Um, it's a little scary. Yeah. But it's also super helpful. Uh, we like, we use ChatGPT in our company all the time. Just like, sure, so do we. You could, like you could just like, setting them yeah, for redundancy. Just, tr I think, I think anyone who's not should just say, okay, well, next time I, I have a, a problem I want to solve, just, just see first if ChatGPT can solve it for me. Don't think, oh, no, I can't solve it. Just see. You probably can't. And then, you, then your eyes open up. Yeah, it's crazy. Mate, it's been a good chat. Um, where can people get hold of you if they need to? Uh, we, we're at method.me. We made a, we made a not .com, method.me. We made a, a, a page, method.me slash uh, site shed, Sorry. where there is a, a checklist that I think your listeners can go through to help them figure out what they should automate. It's really just the same things I was, I was saying um, in terms of Look for things that are highly repetitive. Look things that I'm, going to do that I'm looking at it right now. So that's for you guys out there. We'll put links to it in the show notes, of course, but um, it's uh, method.me forward slash site shed. Links in the show notes. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna fill it out now actually, because now you got me thinking. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, mate, I appreciate the time. Thanks so much. I know it's getting on over there, so I'll let you get on with your evening. Uh, afternoon but um yeah if you guys have any questions around this or any tech related uh feedback anything like that any problems or issues that you've had um yeah you know respond to this email where you see it come through or comment on the post where you see it on socials or youtube or whatever and then let us know i'm sure i could uh coax paul uh back into a answer some questions yeah sure we'll talk some baseball too totally right we will <laughs> All right, listeners. Well, that is a wrap. Thank you, Paul. And we'll chat to you in the upcoming episode. Ciao. Thanks for having me. New Zealand-based home renovation company, 6,593% ROAS. Sydney-based solar company, 2,700% ROAS. Hunter region-based bathroom renovation company, 5,616% ROAS. Melbourne-based building company, 13,182% return on ad spend. Adelaide-based solar company, 2,881% return on ad spend. Guys, the list goes on and on. If you are a trade-based business and you work with projects like roofing, solar, bathroom renovations, kitchen renovations, anything like that, head across to tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. tradey.wiki forward slash pod for podcast. Book in a conversation. It is game changing.